It's wonderful to be here today. Thank you very much for the introduction, Aubrey. Um, my name is Dr. Simi, and I'm going to be speaking around something slightly different. So not to DNA uh, repair, but actually around estrogen and the value and the power uh, that it has um, within patients. So as a physician myself, one of the most important things to me is actually how do we translate all of this wonderful science we have into something that's useful for the people who sit in front of us, our patients. So that's kind of what my focus is going to be on. There we go. Okay, so uh, I always like to start these things with a question. I see some people who are uh, in Lisbon uh, here, so probably some have heard this talk before. But a question for everyone in the room. Um, who actually agrees with the statement that estrogen compounds are anti-aging therapies? Okay, not bad. In the US, every hand goes up, so that's the aim. The aim is to get every hand to go up today. Um, my aim is to help under everyone here understand why estrogen compounds are anti-aging therapies uh, by presenting some of the evidence that we have. So I think to answer the question, the first thing we have to do is understand actually what it is, is it to be an anti-aging therapy? Um, there are lots of different definitions that you could take, but ultimately I think uh, when we think about anti-aging therapies, what we're really talking about are things or compounds that um, are focusing on slowing down or counter counteracting processes associated with aging. Now, um, what I would say is that there are two ways that medicine is typically practiced. One of them is very reactive, which is actually the great majority, unfortunately, still. So this ultimately means that we wait for disease to happen, and then when disease happens, we then want to you know, fix the problem. Uh, and then the other side, of course, is proactive. So this is the idea that, no, instead of waiting for disease, we actually uh, go in and proactively try and prevent disease from happening. Um, and this is very much heavily based on the geroscience hypothesis, which ultimately tells us that if we focus on reducing a pro or attacking a process of aging, you can potentially double life expectancy. And this is where we see really big um, impact and really where we want to be practicing and where we want to focus. So because of this uh, motion and movement, what we are seeing is a movement more towards um, repurposing existing drugs we have. So I know we've had many talks on this, but ultimately things like metformin, rapamycin, uh, the um, weight loss drugs, so your sodium glucose transport inhibitors, are being looked at um, from a more longevity point of view. So actually, can we use these drugs to um, help us extend lifespan? Um, but actually, from my perspective, there is a drug that has been around far longer than most of them, is very heavily researched, uh, but is very much an underdog. And as I saw from the few hands that were up, most people don't really see or understand as a longevity drug. But actually, there's a huge body of evidence that says that um, estrogen is very much um, an anti-aging therapy and actually can be used to massively reduce chronic inflammation. And so I'm sure, again, we've heard a lot about this, but um, we know that the hallmarks of aging represent uh, some of the aging processes or biological processes happening in the body that drive aging. And uh, one of these hallmarks is chronic inflammation. Now, um, the, as I've mentioned, there are many different processes that drive aging, but actually, for me specifically, I would say that chronic inflammation is one of the most important. And the reason I say this is because all roads kind of lead to chronic inflammation. Um, we've just heard a lot about senescent cells, um, and one of the reasons we worry a little bit about senescent cells is because of the fact they release uh, inflammatory uh, markers, uh, but also things like mitochondrial dysfunction as well. We see that if um, someone has mitochondria, if there's a significant amount of mitochondrial dysfunction, this can also lead to chronic inflammation as well. And so when I'm assessing patients or when I'm thinking about how do I assess how someone is aging, the thing I'm going to focus on is the chronic inflammation. And what we know is that actually chronic inflammation uh, is quite oftenly actually confused or um, made difficult to read by acute inflammation. So acute inflammation being what we might experience if we have a uh, trauma, but actually chronic inflammation is something that builds over time and increases our risk of chronic disease. And actually, what we're seeing in our um, research is that estrogen has a massive impact on the chronic inflammation um, that we see um, happening in the body. So then the question becomes, can you actually measure chronic inflammation? And the answer is yes, but it's very, very hard. Um, Typically, if you are in a clinic or you're seeing a physician um, and you know, we're talking about inflammation, these are, the, these, are the, these are the markers that you'll see. So TNF-alpha, ESR, HSCRP. Now, these are powerful markers. They are, they're helpful and they can give great information, but they don't really measure chronic inflammation. They measure acute inflammation. 
And actually, a lot of effort to measure chronic inflammation is typically skewed by the acute inflammation in the body. And so what you really want is you want a marker that's sterile, so it's really only measuring chronic inflammation. Very hard to um, do. Uh, but also, you want something that's going to be responding really, relatively quickly. And what I mean by that is that it changes very early before disease becomes a problem. Because actually, if we're really talking about proactive medicine, preventative medicine, then what you need is something that's going to change well in advance of disease becoming a problem. So does this exist? Yes, is my answer. Um, surprise, surprise. Uh, so um, at Glycan Age, one of the things we focus on are glycans. Now, um, I'm going to ask a question. I'm sure everyone's going to be like, yeah, I know what a glycan is. Um, <laughs> who here knows what a glycan actually is? You've told, that, clearly, all of you guys have spoken to us today, so that's fine. Um, glycans are these, uh, uh, these carbohydrate-based polymers, and they exist pretty much on every cell in the body. Um, they're very important for cell-to-cell -cell communication, but actually, one of the most important things they do is um, func make your proteins functional. So um, one thing I will say uh, that I think is very, very important, because we have a naming issue in our industry, uh, gly gly glycans are not the same thing as glycation. So um, glycation is what we see in HbA1c. It's what you measure in your diabetic population. Uh, that is not what we're looking at. We're looking at glycosylation. It's very different. So if we take our minds back to high school biology, I'm sure um, everyone sort of knows about this, but basically you have a cell. Within your cell, you have the nucleus. In the nucleus, you have the genetic material. This genetic material is then transcribed and translated into a protein. When that protein is initially made, it is not functional. It cannot do very much. It is just a primary protein. In order for it to become functional, there are a number of uh, modifications that have to happen. One of them is called glycosylation. So it goes into a different apparatus in the cell. Uh, glycans are added to the protein, and that is what makes the protein functional. So just as a kind of example of how clinically relevant they are, um, if we think about our blood type, um, Every blood cell, a red blood cell, is a protein, but actually the blood type is determined by the glycans on the surface of the protein. So this kind of really highlights the importance of glycans in our biology and how effective they are um, in making us multicellular organisms, organisms that can function. So at Glycan Age, one of the key things we focus on, we, don't, we can't focus on every single glycan because unfortunately it's very, very complicated. Uh, what we focus on instead is uh, IgG. So IgG being a really important protein, which is in your adaptive immune system. So uh, for want of a better word, you, the part of your immune system that learns, that changes as you're exposed to more disease. And what we're finding is that actually these glycans that are attached to your IgG molecules or your IgG proteins, um, over time they change. And they change not just with time, so they have a normal... Um, they have a normal process of change as you age, which is normal, but also actually they respond to various interventions such as lifestyle, um, the way you eat, the way you exercise, for example. And what happens is these glycans become increasingly pro-inflammatory as you age. So they go from being nice and stable anti-inflammatory where your immune system is functioning as it's meant to. So it's in perfect balance, I say. So um, what we really want is an immune system that is reactive enough that if you get sick, it's going to respond, but not so reactive that it is attacking your own body, which is what we see in autoimmune conditions, right? So when we have a nice balanced immune system, what this means is that the glycans attached to our IgG are anti-inflammatory, so they're positive. When the immune system is out of balance, what we see is that there's lots of pro-inflammatory glycans, and that's what we don't want. And as I mentioned, what we see is that these glycans don't just change with aging and time. They, are, they also change with environment and with lifestyle, with pharmacological interventions as well. And this becomes incredibly important because actually one of the difficult things in this industry is that it's really, really hard to measure longevity. It's very difficult to measure um, when um, someone is, ex is, is experiencing longevity or how do you actually tell if an intervention is working for someone. You need markers to be able to show you that something is working for someone and it uh, is actually improving their biological process of aging. And glycans are one of the few things that can do that. So what's the other powerful thing about glycans? Um, it's around the correlation with disease. So uh, we did a large study where we were looking at um, various different glycans in the body. And what we found is that not only do glycans respond to interventions, but they actually can correlate with disease as well. So what I mean by this is that if you, look, if you take a cohort of people um, who have a certain disease, what you expect to see is they will present with a similar pattern of um, glycans in their system and demonstrating a similar cr um, chronic inflammation pattern. 
And what this means is that you ultimately have a marker that can be potentially used for early disease detection. But what's even more powerful about them is that they change up to 10 years in advance. Um, and I did have a slide in here which kind of showed the different AUCs, but I've taken it out just because of my time limit. Um, but if anyone does want to see that, please do come and see me, and I can, I can share that with you as well. And so, you know, I've kind of gone off topic a little bit, but let's go back to estrogen and how that actually relates. Um, so what we know is that men and women age differently. It's a fact. So uh, while women have a longer life expectancy, they actually spend a lot more time in poor health. And um, if we look at glycans, and we look at glycans across both men and women, so this is a population of 5,000 people across um, Europe, and what you see is that um, in the blue, you can see men age very linearly, whereas women seem to have this sigmoidal characteristic um, aging profile. And of course, that's happening around the age of 50. Can we guess what it is? Menopause. There we go, exactly. It is menopause. And the relevance or the clinical relevance of that comes from um, this. If you look at a woman who undergoes menopause at the age of less than 40, her all-cause uh, mortality risk is 25% higher than somebody who goes through menopause at 45 to 49. Pausing for dramatic effect. <laughs> That's huge, it's, it's massive. And it really does demonstrate just how um, important the hormones, and estrogen in particular, is within um, the, the process of aging that we have. But then the question becomes, what is it exactly about estrogen that is uh, having this huge effect on the way that we age? And this is a study that we did where we ultimately looked at people who were premenopausal, and then we looked at people who were menopausal, and we looked at men. And what we found is, so you have your good glycans, your anti-inflammatory glycans here, and you have your pro-inflammatory, so your bad glycans here. When you're looking at premenopausal women, uh, they have lots of good glycans and very few bad glycans. When you look at menopausal women, that completely flips. And what you see is that you have a massive um, decrease in your anti-inflammatory glycans and a massive increase in your pro-inflammatory glycans, and actually to the point that it's worse than what you see in men. And so, again, you're seeing this uh, shift in glycans and a shift towards a very pro-inflammatory profile, um, and that is what we believe is causing um, this increased risk of things like cardiovascular disease that we see in postmenopausal women. And, of course, we're scientists, so this was not enough. Uh, we uh, did a study, and I always say that I don't know why anyone would, would uh, volunteer to be in this study, um, but we basically took a group of women, we suppressed their uh, hormones, so we gave them GNRH to suppress their hormones, and then we split that group into two. And what we did is, in one group, we gave nothing, so they were basically induced into menopause, and in the other group, we gave estrogen back. And what we found is that in the group who we gave estrogen back to, their inflammation levels stayed the same. In the group where we um, did not give estrogen back, so they, made, they stayed in menopause ultimately, uh, you see a 25% increase in their chronic inflammation. And so here what you're seeing is uh, ultimately direct cause and effect, that actually when you are uh, suppressing uh, their hormones and you're not giving that estrogen, you are seeing an increase in or a worsening of their um, pro-inflammatory glycans. And so if we go back to our original definition of actually what is an anti-aging therapy around this idea of it's something that is looking at a process of aging, that is exactly what estrogen is doing. It is attacking a process of aging, uh, which is chronic inflammation. And of course, as I mentioned, my focus is around how do we translate science into something that is clinically relevant for the people who sit in front of us. Um, and actually, what we know is that uh, in people who are suffering from, who, who, have, who are in the perimenopause or who are menopausal, there are, clinical, um, there are clinical effects. And so what we see is that women who are uh, perimenopause have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, but also osteoporosis, for example, and various other um, chronic conditions. And actually, in studies that have been done where we give that HRT back, so where we give the estrogen back, we see that there's a significant reduction in all-cause mortality. And of course, then this becomes very powerful and important in understanding actually how is it that estrogen is having it, its effect in reducing chronic inflammation. So one question I always get asked is around men as well, um, because most people seem to think that estrogen is a women-only drug or a women-only hormone. Incorrect. Uh, men have estrogen too. <laughs> Um, and actually, in a study that we did where we were looking at men between the ages of 20 and 50, we're trying to assess the effects of testosterone uh, and also estrogen as well. Uh, what we did is in group A, we basically gave gosrelin, which is, a, again, something that suppresses hormones. And what we found is that when you suppress testosterone and estrogen, 
uh, but you replace testosterone, of course, it is converted to estrogen from aromatase, which is the normal thing that happens. And so in this group, you have a normal effect and you have normal, an, an, a normal um, process and um, benefit of estrogen. In the second group, we suppressed testosterone and suppressed estrogen, but we also gave an astrazole, which is basically preventing the conversion of, um, of testosterone to estrogen. And what happens is when you remove estrogen from men, you do, not get the, you do not get the benefit of improved chronic inflammation. And so it is estrogen that is having the beneficial effect in men as well when it comes to chronic inflammation. And so I say this is important because there are lots of clinics, for example, who uh, focus on or practice a hormone replacement therapy and will use aromatase inhibitors, which of course there are, you know, they have their place, but it can be um, negative in the fact that you're actually reducing the estrogen, which we know is what's um, offering the chronic inflammation benefit. And I'm just going to, before I finish, uh, go on, talk about this study very briefly. So this was a very, well, to me, was a very interesting study. And what we were looking at was a group of individuals who had, men who had HIV. And what you have here in the black is the control group. So these are individuals, so cis men who do not have HIV. In the red, you have cis men who do have HIV. And as you can expect, there is an increase in the amount of pro-inflammatory glycans because, of course, there is disease. And then the purple group is a very unique subset of um, transgender women. So these are men who, were, who, these people who are assigned men at birth but are transitioning. And so they are on, um, they're on, they're on um, estrogen therapy. And what you can see is actually the pro-inflammatory glycans in the group of people who are on um, estrogen therapies is almost equal to what you see in the controls who don't have disease, even though they have disease. And so again, you're seeing um, the actual um, clinical benefit of estrogen, not just in um, longevity, but also in pathology as well. And again, that's incredibly powerful. And so I'm going to end here. I've gone over slightly. Um, but one of the key things that we have to do as uh, practitioners, physicians, people who are looking after patients is we often have to have insight into the things that they cannot see. Um, when we think about chronic inflammation, it is something that you cannot see. Uh, when we think about menopause, there is chronic inflammation that's brewing in the body that people cannot see. Cardiovascular disease is not something that you feel. You do not feel the risk of cardiovascular disease. But actually, it's incredibly important that we, as uh, professionals, are acting on behalf of our patients and treating it what they cannot see. I'm going to leave the case study up there, but I'm actually out of time. Um, but I think the key thing I wanted to really uh, highlight is just that importance of really acting and advocating on behalf of our patients and protecting them from what they can't see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right there, no? oh, sorry. Um, so thank you so much, Semi. That was, that was a really lovely talk. And um, I think one thing I want to highlight here is, you know, a lot of you have heard of glyconase before, and you think of it as a company that markets just, you know, a, a, a diagnostic, a measure of biological age, um, of which there are plenty. So I think it was particularly useful that we've heard now how that can translate into something much more, you know, relevant Sweet. to intervention. And, um, you yeah, so that know, was, that was exactly the talk I hoped for. Thank Good. you so much. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's one up right there. Who's got the microphone? Um, right up there. Sorry, I was trying to run off stage, but apparently I have to answer questions. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> I really appreciated the talk. I use a lot of transdermal estrogen in my practice, mm -hmm. but I'm having trouble reconciling the life extension we see with castration um, with, you know, the hypothesis that estrogen is life extending. I don't expect an answer. I think that's just a really interesting thing to think about, but I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on it. Yeah, no, it's a really great question, and you're right, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I think that what we do know is that in the studies that we've done where we've looked specifically at when you're, when you're giving estrogen or you're giving HRT, we are seeing this improvement. It's, I, I honestly don't have an answer for what, um, for what we see in castration and why uh, you do see an increase in life expectancy and what that might be caused by, but I think we also need to accept that actually our gonads uh, do a lot more than just produce hormones. And so there's probably or potentially many things that are um, happening that maybe we're not considering that actually are being removed when we do castration as well that may be uh, having a balancing effect. But I don't have a specific answer for that, but that's ultimately what I'd be thinking. All right, one more question. Uh, have you got the microphone? Uh, no, 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 let's have the microphone. We want it. We want it um, Um, fascinating talk. Um, 
just kind of uh, wondering sort of your opinion for um, young women who get things like, for example, breast cancer. Fortunately, my own sister is a breast cancer survivor. When they're hormone positive, they'll actually often induce mm. menopause and kind of shut down your you know, ability to, to you know, have estrogen and, and block it with tamoxifen and stuff. So what would you recommend for those that unfortunately, you know, due to sort of, you know, their, their just cancer can't actually get the estrogen therapy? Yeah. So um, I get this question a lot, actually, especially after this talk, because I think a lot of people recognize that there is this movement towards seeing estrogen as this uh, very valuable um, drug that we have. But as always, I think with every patient, it's, it has to be managed on a case-by-case -case basis, right? And in any kind of medication that we're prescribing for any patients, we should always be doing risk-benefit analysis ultimately. And to me, what this means is that if you have a patient who does have this risk of breast cancer, you really do have to um, balance it with the risk that we see with increasing risk of cardiovascular disease with loss of estrogen, right? And actually, it becomes a kind of balancing act of figuring out what um, is best. Now, I've gone to workshops in the US where actually I've seen um, physicians who will still prescribe HRT for women who have a history of breast cancer. They'll still do it. Um, and I think it ultimately comes down to a clinical decision in balancing what we think might be most beneficial or uh, not so beneficial for clients. But I have seen people still prescribe women who have had a history of breast cancer and um, HRT. Thank you. And last question over here. Um, who's got the microphone? Yeah. Uh, wait for the microphone. It might be long. Uh, wait, wait. It's coming. Hi, um, Simisola. Sim yes. Um, that was a great uh, talk um, and will open up a lot of questions. I think because uh, where I'm from, there's a lot of people, a lot of women who have not commenced mm. HRT because of the fear associated with breast cancer. Um, and then there's uh, also the problem of once understanding that it does work, recommencing it at a later stage and the contraindications for recommencing HRT um, once you're past 10 years past menopause. Sorry, is the question around recommencing past, yeah, what, past 10 years? Yeah, what, um, what advice would you have on that? Is there any new developments mm. on, um, on recommencing um, HRT? Yeah, so I have to be careful here because I'm trying not to give medical advice on stage. Um, but, I mean, the, the evidence is clear around when uh, it is best to start HRT, and, and that is typically around perimenopause. Um, typically, a lot of the research is showing that actually once, if you're starting 10 years post, it is not having the same benefit. And so, largely speaking, in an ideal world, you do want women to be starting during the perimenopause as opposed to after they've already gone through the change because you don't see the same benefits. Um, and, and just one thing really to answer your question, to address what you said. So there is a lot of fear uh, still in the world around breast cancer and HRT, we know this. But one thing that I think we have to recognize is actually a woman is 10 times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease after menopause than she is to develop breast cancer. So, you know, really, where do you want to put your eggs if you're, if you're really looking at the clinical numbers and what we're seeing in practice? So again, I, I really, you know, a lot of people do come to me and say, oh, I can't believe you're saying everyone should be on HRT because I do believe that we should be prescribing in spite of instead of like saying we're not going to prescribe. I think we should be giving and then saying, why, why do I not need to give as opposed to not giving? Um, and I say that because of, the, because of the numbers and because of the facts that actually women are at far higher risk of cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.